So, here we are again. Um, we got an infinite stream and we cannot create some, so we gotta do something here. And um, stream is different than the Java iterable in that it supports many, many useful methods out of the standard Scala collection library. Uh, one of them is called take while. So, um, this will take the first elements of the stream that suffice a given condition, which we'll pass in as an argument here, and um, as soon as it encounters an element which does not suffice this condition anymore, the stream will finish. So ret the return stream will be truncated. And of course we want to take them while, let's say, x is smaller than 4 million. Yeah, that's 4 million. And then we have a stream as a result, which is actually finite, so we can compute the sum. Um, it's interesting to note that here, uh, when we call filter and in the resulting stream we call take while, uh, up to this point, no element of the stream has actually been produced. It's actually been iterated. New streams are being created, which are filtered and uh, truncated but their values are only calculated when needed. So actually not much more memory is consumed here after all these calls. Only the new for the new stream objects which are pretty small. And only some method uh, iterates over the elements of the stream and only then are the uh, elements generated on the fly and immediately forgotten afterwards. That's really, really useful. Um, yeah, now let's compile it to see if I made any mistakes. Might be, not sure. Yeah, it was all okay. Now, again, let's run our little program. It's the same number as before, which is correct. Great. But now we can simplify this code some more. First, let's take a look at those closures here. First at this one, which determines if a number is an even number. We can simplify this quite a bit um, because this one is a special case of a closure. Note that we, o with that we have uh, one parameter and this parameter is used in the body of the closure only once. So it's kind of a waste to declare it a name, to give it a name and uh, use this name then only once. Mm, there is a syntax uh, which tells the compiler I have an anonymous, anonymous parameter here which I use only once. So I don't need to assign it a name. I will show it to you now. First we can discard with the declaration of the variable x. And then of course x is an unknown term to the compiler so we got to substitute it with something. And that something is the underscore. Um, as soon as the compiler encounters this underscore here, it will immediately know that we are inside uh, an anonymous function right now, a closure, and that this closure has one argument, and this argument has no name. You don't need to. So what is written here now is basically the same that was written before just before the parameter had a name, x, and now it doesn't have a name, so we don't need to declare a parameter list. If I were to use the uh, underscore at different points here also, for example here, now this would be an anonymous function with two parameters. The repetition of the underscore is not a reference to the previous parameter and saying this is the same as the previous one. It always like generates a new parameter. So this would be a function with two parameters, which we don't want here. We want only one parameter. And um, this here is quite the same. We only have one parameter, so we can make it an anonymous parameter. There you go. And now I compile it. And of course it builds. Very nice thing here. So we can um, pass very easy operations, very easy tests, for example, on numbers um, to a function with uh, having uh, very little overhead for the declaration of an anonymous function. Mm. 
still there is something to optimize here. We can make the code even more, even shorter. This is the Fibonacci function. It's quite nice, however, um, look at the body of Fib. It only serves the purpose to call recurse with the first two arguments. It would be great if we could somehow include this functionality into the Fib function itself and do without recurse. Uh, one thing we might do is uh, we might use default arguments. So if we don't pass in the value of A, we say it's 1 by default. And if we don't pass in the value of B, we say it's 2 by default. So we can leave out the arguments here. Um, default arguments, I think they are also present in the Java programming language. And uh, here, in this call, we don't provide any arguments, so the compiler uses all of the default arguments, one for A, two for B. And here in this internal recourse call, we explicitly give the values for A and B, so the compiler uses none of the default arguments. Pretty neat. Um, however, one strange thing is we cannot leave out the type declaration here. I don't know why. The compiler could infer that A must probably be an integer. However, we are not allowed to leave it out at this point. There must be a good reason for it. I don't know it. So, now the FIP method, uh, FIP method itself doesn't do much anymore. We might actually substitute it for recurse. See what I did now? And of course we can get without this body. So now we have a completely sing simple and recursive definition for FIP which uses default arguments, so it can be invoked without arguments. I left out one brace, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it calls itself, um, and there is one thing we still need to change right now, because I told you when an argument list is left out for a method, when there's a method without arguments and you don't use the round bra braces for the empty parameter list, only then can you call that f method without providing the empty parameter list, like this. But now we have a non-empty parameter list. It has, it has two parameters, but we don't supply any of those. Still, the compiler at this point requires us to give the braces here, to uh, especially notify him that we don't want to provide any of the arguments, although we could. So yeah, this I will compile right now, and it compiles very fine. Now run it. There you go. Correct result. And this also is already the final version of our solution for Euler problem 2. It's a two-liner this time, and now if you look, for example, at the definition of FIP, I find it first of all more reusable than the Java version because it doesn't have any ending, it's an infinite stream of Fibonacci numbers like it is uh, thought to be. And also um, I find it more understandable because it's more closely related to what the Fibonacci sequence actually is. It's a stream of numbers which starts with the first element and uh, then um, the rest of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and also the line with the printer n, which computes the solution. For me, it's easier to understand what it does. Uh, of course, uh, it's a more condensed code, but um, judge for yourself. Compare it with the Java version or with the Java style version and see which one you might understand faster if you don't know already what it does. Well, this concludes our second part, which is, as I hoped, uh, much faster than the first part and I hope to go on and uh, show you more solutions for Project Euler with Scala. Until then, wish you a nice day. Bye bye.